In the beginning, darkness was on the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God created creatures of every kind. But humanity has exploited his creation in the name of the almighty dollar. Until today, thousands of species are on the brink of extinction. But there are those who are acting to save endangered species before it's too late. Dawn across the vast African plains. The red sky heralding another day on this ancient continent. But this red sky isn't predicting bad weather, at least not as we know it. There'll be no stormy conditions today, the same as there hasn't been for most of the year. Southern Africa, you see, is in the grip of yet another drought, making life even tougher than normal for the animals that live here. But it hasn't always been this way. The continent of Africa is almost as old as the Earth itself. Originally, it was the foundation of a huge supercontinent called Pangaea. While other continents have shifted and drifted apart amid earthquakes and violent volcanic eruptions, Africa's location has barely changed. The wide lowland bush and savannas of this great continent have been created by the forces of nature and the ravages of time. And today, this rolling belt is the home of a spectacular menagerie, rich in its variety and diversity. proud and upright giraffe. It's the tallest animal in the world. The striking but flighty zebra. The comical but dangerous hippo. In the last few hundred years, Africa's animals have come to epitomize the very term wildlife in the consciousness of the Western world. The elephant with its massive size and awesome tusks. The rhinoceros with its fiery temperament and fearsome horn are two of the largest and most admired and respected herbivores on earth. Then there are the big carnivores, just as impressive and dominant in this rugged landscape. The lion has long been known as the king of the beasts for majestically obvious reasons. The leopard is renowned for its mercurial movement and cunning hunting skills. and the cheetah with its lanky steel sprung legs standing alone as the fastest mammal on the planet.
Together, the big cats and the enormous herbivores have earned the title of the Big Five. They are the superstars of the animal kingdom. Yet despite their high profile and their place in humanity's heart, all of these loved species are teetering on the brink of extinction and have earned a new title, that of endangered or threatened species. Two of that big five, the rhinoceros and the cheetah, are critically endangered. Their future is even more precarious than the other three species and their survival hangs by a thread and is reliant on the successful management of their gene pool, their environment, and of their public profile. The great irony is, while humanity now protects these animals, it is the pressure of human population, particularly since European arrival in Africa, which has forced the retreat of Africa's wildlife to the limited safety of national parks and game reserves. Yet even in these supposedly protected areas, they are not safe from the biggest threat of all, one which threatens the very existence of species and that is taking the big five so perilously close to extinction. South Africa's rugged northeast Transvaal region is in the relentless grip of another drought, as it has been for almost two years out of three over the past few decades. The hope for abundant summer rains was in vain again this year. Now, at the end of another dry season, the land is parched, water holes are drying up, grass is gone, and the trees are all but dead. Ian Sussens manages Shakuda, a 5,000 hectare private game park, and the long dry has him worried. This is one of the phenomena in Africa, and um, the drought seemed to be more, more vicious. And even in the larger conservation areas, um, the impact has been of such devastating nature that they've had to or either reduce the numbers themselves or they've had massive die-offs. It's not only the, the amount of animals that effectively die off, it's, it's the terrible slow death of these animals actually starving to death. At Shakuda, the animals are being fed with hay. It's not ideal, but it will stave off the worst effects of the crippling drought. Whilst the feed is a lifesaver for the animals that would otherwise starve, it also introduces another danger into their lives. And wildlife veterinarian specialist Peter Rogers often has to sort out the damage. As soon as you put four fences around a place, you're interfering with nature straight away. So what happens is, is generally speaking, in a lot of these reserves there is relative overstocking. So in a drought situation, the animals cannot move out. And of course, it leads to, to competition. It's the old story against survival of the fittest. People feed them artificially, brings them to close proximity, and they still have their territorial disputes. So the, the opportunities and chances of injury are, are, are much increased. That's what has happened with this massive male white rhino. It has been in a fight with another rhinoceros or an elephant, and it's been severely gored under its right shoulder and is clearly in pain. If it isn't treated with antibiotics within the next few hours, a severe infection is likely to set in and the animal faces an agonizing death. The rhino had gone into hiding, as do most injured animals, and the rangers have been scouring the bush for several days in search of the injured creature. Now they must immobilize it with a tranquilizer dart so they can treat the injury. Once it's done, the drug starts to take effect, we can go in quickly. 
A tense and dangerous time. One wrong move and this injured rhino could turn on its helpers and attack them, ending in injury or death of either men or rhino or both. A hit, but not a clean shot. The dart may have been deflected by a twig. Now the chase is on. He's gone behind me. The animal is now at great risk. In its drug state, go it could injure that. itself further in the rugged terrain, or worse, be killed by another animal. There are two of the world's five species of rhinoceros in southern Africa, the white and the black rhino, and both are teetering on the edge of extinction. Despite this, many Africans know little about how endangered their wildlife is. At this ecological awareness camp, teenagers are learning the difference between their two rhino species. These are the white rhinos. They eat grass and they've got wide lips. Wide lips. These are the black rhinos, they eat from the trees and they've got long lips. Long lips. <laughs> These enthusiastic actors also explain how the two species got their names. You know, the white rhino is the white mount. And also this is the, the, is the black rhino. Is the Early Dutch rhino. explorers named the white rhinos white mount rhino for their wide mouths, adapted for grazing the open veldt. British colonialists mistook white for white and in their ignorance decided the leaf browsing species they discovered feeding in woodland should be called black rhino. Neither species are actually coloured to match their names, but the so-called white rhino is often lighter toned in its open grazing environment. It was the white rhino's preference for feeding an open country that almost led to its extinction. They were easy prey for the big game hunters. It was here at Umfalozi in southern Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province where they made their last stand just over a century ago. Conservation manager Peter Hartley is proud of the game reserve's role in preserving both the white and black species of rhino. This is one of the oldest parks in Africa, uh, well over 100 years now. Originally proclaimed to save the white rhino. At the turn of the century, or just before the turn of the century, it was thought that the white rhino had become extinct, the southern white rhino. And a hunting party hunting between the two Umfalozi rivers, the black and the white Umfalozi river, shot a number of, of rhino that they assumed were black rhino. But on close inspection they found they were indeed white rhino and hence the conservation of the species started. Um, and it's one of the organisation's success stories from an estimated population of between 20 and 30 white rhino between the white and black Umfalozi rivers. They've now increased to some 11,000. 4,000 of those are on private land. So a real success story in terms of the conservation for that species. Meanwhile, back at Shakuda, the wildlife officers and vets, after more than half an hour and an almost two kilometer run through the bush, have finally caught the wounded rhino. Well, once you work with an animal in the wild, you treat him for his injuries or whatever. You've got to do all the treatment then because that's your only one and only chance. You can't sort of say, come back tomorrow and dart him again. You've got to do everything you can then. So you give him a battery of, of treatment and then injections and that's the last you see of it. You just hope that it's going to be okay. So from that point of view, it, it's, it's you know, a little bit of a disadvantage because you treat the animal and you let it go back into nature again. And often you, you may not see it again and sometimes it may be too late. If it needs to follow treatment, they might not be able to find it again. A happy ending to a dramatic encounter. And with luck, this white rhino bull will recover. Although the white rhino species isn't out of the woods yet, 
the story is even worse for the beleaguered black wino. A very different character, it has suffered a similar fate. Wildlife vet specialist Dave Cooper knows the black rhino better than just about anybody in Africa. Well, in many ways, it's like chalk and cheese, and it's possibly the reason why the white rhino just about went, went extinct at one stage, and the black rhino, there's still, still plenty of them around in Africa anyway. And the reason being is that they're pretty much um, solitary animals, they're highly adaptable animals, and they tend to find themselves in terrain that people just don't like. And uh, it's, it's for that reason that they were able to survive. Um, sure, eventually pressure got to them, but the fact that so many survived when the white rhino were just about gone um, speaks for itself. That preference for sheltered areas which kept the black rhino safe in the early days has also provided cover for those who have hunted it for its horn. Prized in the Middle East for knife handles and in some parts of Asia as an aphrodisiac. Also playing against them was their character very different from the basically shy white rhino. They're very inquisitive animals. Uh, they spend most of the day lying under a tree in a mud wallow. So very easy to approach, uh, very poor eyesight, and very inquisitive. You know, black rhino, you can make a noise, instead of running away, they'll actually come and see what, what's making the noise. So that obviously has affected uh, them, but I, I think the demand for rhino horn in the past has actually been their demise. Whatever the reason, character, Habit, habitat, or just plain human greed, the black rhino went almost as close to extinction as the white rhino had done a century earlier. And continues to do so, because the black market demand for rhino horn remains, despite a massive international effort to discourage the trade. Unfortunately, there are still those prepared to break the law for a quick profit, and where there's greed, there's violence. In 1970, there was an estimated 63,000 uh, black rhino. By 19, the no, 1990s, there were an estimated 4,000 black rhino left. So they were really annihilated through Africa as a wave of poaching came through. What we've seen, though, is the black rhino are definitely on the, on the increase. Uh, they're obviously a conservation-dependent species. Without conservation, we're going to lose them. This is the Umfalosi Game Reserve's elite anti-poaching squad. They have reports of snares being set inside the park, and in the back of their minds is always the possibility of confrontation with heavily armed rhino poachers. Yeah, <laughs> Before long, they find a snare, set for an unsuspecting antelope. But this is an indiscriminate killer. It will take anything within reach of its deadly wire noose. Squad leader Robert Malongo knows its deadly effects well. He learned to make snares as a child. I started to go out with my father, I think, while I was like seven years. Then when my father got out to, uh, for crazy, he used to go with me and with his dogs. And he showed me everything, how this thing happened. Like we, trapping baits, hunting, snares, whatsoever, a lot of things. We are learned. What Robert never learned about until he faced them at the wrong end of a gun as a ranger was the kill or be killed attitude of the hardcore professional rhino poacher. His unit know they could be around any bend, over any hill, at any time. At least one gang member is armed with a semi-automatic rifle or automatic rifle, normally an AK-47. And they bring that along, not to down the rhino, they normally use a heavier calibre to down a rhino, but they bring it there for protection against uh, my field rangers and my, my game ranger staff. They normally come from a criminal background. So when they're not shooting rhino, they're actually involved in other illegal activities. So they're bad guys. Not well thought of in the community. Most of them are of warlords and community members actually fear them because of their involvement with crime and hijackings and, and the use of their firearms. However, not all poachers are killing for profit. Some are killing just to survive. Looks like I found the water back here at 1800 Dam, behind the, the rocks. 
near the water pump, but uh, it looks like it's got a, got a snare in it. Ross Dunbar is a wildlife game ranger. He says the people who did this are probably looking for nothing more than a meal. At the end of the day, an antelope like this is probably just a family, somebody who's unemployed. And a hungry stomach's got no ears. So from that point of view, you can almost understand somebody who hasn't got a job is looking for something to eat. The sad thing about it is, though, the majority of snares that are set up like this, a person cannot keep coming back to the same trap every single night. So you're probably only finding about 20% or even 15% of the animals caught in snares are actually utilised. The rest are just left there to die and suffer, and I think that's what makes me so angry. We are basically an island surrounded by over 600,000 people. There is poverty and uh, a lot of people earning well below the breadline, so obviously there's going to be a, a threat to our wildlife populations, not only white and black rhino, but, uh, but you know, for, for food and subsistence type poaching. Although there's a lot of cattle and livestock outside uh, these parks, they don't go around slaughtering their own cattle. That's money in the bank for them. And, um, you know, a Zulu person likes meat, so you know, they all come in for, for meat. And uh, also the excitement of, of the hunt. This is a problem that simply won't go away. It's akin to the slash and burn agriculture of other developing nations like Brazil or Madagascar. The pressure being put on the environment by the local human population in Madagascar was just as threatening as it is in South Africa. And the South Africans are trying to find a viable alternative, just as the Malagasy have. In Madagascar, the key to their success is ecotourism. And there are a number of excellent examples of controlled ecotourism that is proving a huge success. Like the work being done to protect the habitat of the critically endangered Indri, near the east coast of Madagascar. Here the slash and burn agriculture, which was eating into the Indri's habitat, has stopped as the local people today earn a good living as wildlife guides, with the foreigners' dollars and euros staying in the local community. or the incredibly successful ranger scheme set up on the island of Nosimanga Bay. Again, local tribespeople either acting as wardens protecting the island or as wildlife guides taking control of their assets and resources, as Jan Bakarazapi says, using them for the benefit of the whole community. Ecotourism has a, a big importance for our nation uh, because it's among the first uh, activities to bring the money in Madagascar. Similar creative thinking is going on in South Africa. A half hour's drive from the Umphalosi Game Reserve is Pindar Private Game Park. A manager, Kevin Pretorius, is searching for prey. He's not hunting poachers, but rhino. Not to kill them, as some hunters still pay to do, but to treat them. This rhino, cow and calf are perfect subjects for a new phenomenon on the African wildlife tourism landscape, the darting safari. It's more of a security function. This group of tourists are the latest innovation in wildlife safaris. They have paid to be part of the action, helping the game park staff with routine medical examinations. Kevin Pretoria says his visitors take ecotourism in South Africa to a whole new level. There's a new um, tourist out there who actually wants, wants hands on. They don't want to, it's not enough to come to the lodge and then know that they're playing a part in conservation. They actually want to get their hands on kind of experience. There are many people hoping that darting safaris will provide enough excitement to lure people away from wanting to do the real thing, to hunt and kill wildlife. Some game farmers offer a hybrid type of hunting, where customers pay to shoot game themselves with a tranquilizer gun. 
the so-called green hunt. Because you need to get to a relatively close distance to that rhino to, in order to put in a, a good dart, um, there's an element of danger there. And I'd hate to be the person or the veterinarian who's there when a professional hunter is forced to shoot a rhino in order to protect his client. And it's happened on two occasions with me where the guys have actually cocked their rifles and, you know, I just get, I just go cold. We also get the opportunity to involve a lot more people. You know, we can, instead of having one, one chap that actually does the darting himself, as you saw today, we've got a whole group of people and they've all got their little tasks to do. Everyone gets a chance to participate. And um, you're just sharing that the uh, experience out with, with so many more people than if it was just one hunter who, who, who would go out and stalk and dart his animal. But yes, is, it has become quite popular and I think that um, it could, could have a role to play going forward. Another endangered species that is fighting for the space to survive in the wild is the cheetah. The relentless spread of agricultural activity has eaten up many areas of habitat for a wide range of African animals. There is constant pressure for land to be used to feed a burgeoning human population. However, in some areas, that has played into the hands of the cheetah. This big cat isn't the top cat here. Lions and hyenas are the cheetah's main competition for food, and some farmer's fencing has locked out the cheetah's competitors, which means this high-speed daytime hunter is able to thrive. Because there's high stock numbers on these farms or ranches, the animals are not able to move, they breed up on these ranches. The cheetah, they've got no competition for its food, they have no hyenas, no lions. So in, what I'm saying is in certain areas, there's actually been a relative population explosion of cheetahs. However, in some farming areas, the cheetah is still shot by farmers who suspect them of killing their livestock. The loss of every animal carries a potential blow to the future of the species. What worries the experts now is the lack of genetic diversity. Despite the success of a number of cheetah breeding programs, concern remains about inbreeding in the population at large. In the distant past, about 10,000 years ago, some environmental catastrophe killed all but one species of the world's cheetahs. Those remaining were forced to breed with one another, and today's cheetahs are almost genetically identical. In fact, as genetically close as identical twins giving rise to a number of inherent defects and susceptibility to disease. Taste of Vet is a specialist at the Hoodspread Cheetah Research Centre who knows the problems firsthand. There are probably about 15,000 or so left in the world, but most of them in very small populations. No, so none of the populations are actual viable populations, and we need just larger populations to get natural selection operating properly and, and, and get the variability in the, in the genetic uh, setup maintained. This is Lente Ruta. She is a woman with a mission. She has dedicated her life to developing one of Africa's leading cheetah research centers at Hoodspray. I hand raised them. Uh, you can see how tame they are because I've hand raised them, so they know me very well. Her husband Peter helped her develop the centre, and since his tragic death in 2002, the cheetahs have become everything to her. And they were a great comfort to me when my husband died, because uh, I had them in my house, and uh, when I really feel very, very down, I got down on my knees and they were licking me and biting my hair and they were a big, big comfort to me. Now she has a plan to repay them and help save the species. Only certain animals do breed very well in captivity. So it's very important uh, that you uh, uh, get new bloodlines in all the time. What we've established here is a cheetah rescue unit. We go to the farmers and we convince the farmers not to shoot them, but rather catch them and we pay the farmer. The biggest threat to this plan is introduced disease from the collected animals. So the cheetahs acquired by the Hoodspread Centre are quarantined for a period to make sure they're not carrying any contagious feline diseases that could infect the other animals. 
While in quarantine, the cheetahs are given a thorough medical examination to make sure they're not suffering from any of the congenital conditions that plague the species. One of the conditions they look out for is deformities in the teeth that can require surgery. The species is also susceptible to a range of gastric conditions that can often be detected early by internal examination and removal of tissue samples for analysis. Once they have a clean bill of health, the cheetahs can be released. Nevertheless, the lack of genetic diversity is still the biggest threat to the species. But Lente has a plan to help minimize the problem, and that is to rotate the male cheetah between locations. Once they have bred with the females at one location, the males are relocated to another and allowed to mate with the females there. An attempt to stop inbreeding by maximizing the genetic diversity amongst their limited numbers. Been involved in the reintroduction of, of captive bred cheetah, plenty, back into the wild and very successfully. One must remember that even as born in captivity, those instincts are always there. Those natural instincts show when he's, he's, he's bred in captivity, he's not going to be fit, fit. So what we usually do is when you release them, you put a collar on and you monitor them. For the first three months, he's going to find he's, he's chases something and he's, he's, he gives up after 50 meters. And you see three days later, the guy's a bit hungry, give him a bit of food. But you'll see within three months, he's back to, to his natural, no problem whatsoever. At the other end of the country, near Cape Town, the Cheetah Outreach Centre is focused on educating the public to the potential plight of the cheetah in the wild. Here, tame cheetahs get the message across to visitors by making themselves available for photo opportunities and exhibiting their speed and agility to the public. Education officer Dawn Glover strives to get the message across to the widest possible audience. Our cats see, what, about half a million people a year? And those are people who are then coming into conservation field, spreading the word themselves or giving money to, for the institute conservation and for the programs that we support with our awareness. As at many athletic meetings, the sprinters steal the limelight while the distance runners toil in anonymity. Everybody, it seems, knows the plight of the speedy cheetah, but the marathon runners of the African bush are almost unknown, and even more endangered than the cheetah. These long-distance runners are the African wild dog, or painted hunting dog. They can run up to 70 kilometers in a day as the pack crisscrosses the veldt in search for prey. There are very few areas of wilderness left that can provide a home spacious enough for such fleet-footed wanderers which can reach more than 60 kilometers an hour at top speed. However, Dave Cooper says they won't be able to outrun extinction without our help. We don't have enough territories that are large enough to sustain um, viable populations. In this country, Kruger Park, yes, has probably got the only, the only sort of area big enough. Umphalosi Game Reserve, only a fraction of the size of the massive Kruger National Park to the north, is home to three packs of wild dogs. In an area of 660 square kilometers, their long distance adventures bring them into occasional public view. African wild dogs live in a tight knit social group and hunt cooperatively, preying primarily on grazing animals such as gazelles, springboks, wildebeest and zebras. Most predators stalk or ambush their prey, but these dogs make no attempt to hide. While most hunters rely on their camouflage to help them hunt, these painted dogs do the opposite. They use their brightly painted coats to help them hunt. Just the sight of them approaching will spook a herd into stampede. They then single out an individual, usually the young, or one that's slowed by old age or disease, and chase it until it's exhausted. The dogs are swift, tireless runners. They've been known to chase prey for an hour, for as far as five and a half kilometers in a single burst. But most of them are out of view and need to be tracked using special radio tracking devices. 
The Umphalosi dogs are under close scrutiny as scientists try to learn more about their breeding cycles and survival needs. Certainly in Umphalosi, the dogs are doing well. Unfortunately, due to their, their nature, it's a very dynamic society. It uh, chops and changes. One minute you've got 25 dogs, tomorrow you've got two, three dogs. But uh, you know, I think they're holding their own, and I, I think it's, it's good that we've, we've got wild dogs in captivity, you know, at least we maintain that gene pool. And uh, we, we've come a long, long way with the metapopulation uh, principles of managing wild dogs. African wild dogs have an unusual breeding system. Only the dominant alpha female reproduces in a pack. Other pack members act cooperatively to care for the young of the breeding pair. It has been said that African wild dogs are one of the most social of all mammals never living apart from the pack at any stage in their lives. Their breeding is seasonal at the end of the rainy season when game is plentiful, when their litter sizes can range from between two and 19 pups. Although females are physically sexually mature at 18 months, breeding is suppressed by the presence of the dominant female. But much of this knowledge is only fairly recent and comes from the several successful captive breeding programs, including the Hoodspread Cheetah Center. But the worry is that it may be too late to save the painted hunting dogs in the wild. That's, I think, one of the multi-million dollar questions, whether we would actually be able to, to actually do that eventually. <clears throat> I'm a, positive person I hope we will we will be able to attain it but there's some doubt I guess whether we will actually be able to get enough wild dogs out there uh, to ensure their future in the long term. The wild dog is still going to have a, a rough ride by their nature they like to roam a lot they need big spaces a country like South Africa with all the fencing you know they just haven't got those spaces they are obviously also conflict with livestock farming which is we, we're never going to to rid unfortunately although the perceptions uh, particularly from livestock farmers in South Africa have, have actually improved towards the wild dog and we're seeing cases where they would call conservation departments to ask them to come and remove the wild dog rather than just shoot them. So I think there's, the, the perceptions of wild dogs have changed, um, which is very important for them, but I, I think they've still got a rough, rough road. They are certainly the animal that is threatened most by encroachment due to people and the diseases that their domestic animals are carrying. And we've, we've seen it time and time again, um, wild dogs literally being wiped out of the Serengeti Mara Mara with canine distemper virus, rabies coming into Madikwe gamers that killed off all their wild dogs. There is now a move to reclaim the land from the ravages of human encroachment. Near the coast at St Lucia, an hour east of Mfalosi, these teenagers are doing just that. As part of a community project funded by the Wildlands Trust, they are clearing out alien plants and replanting native species. A restored forest environment here could host a wide range of wildlife, including the graceful and secretive leopard. Andrew Venter of the Wildlands Trust is leading this push to reclaim the natural habitats and to turn around the human damage to the environment. We're just seeing the change. We're seeing this incredible enthusiasm from communities throughout the area, um, people really buying into it, buying into the, the opportunities that they're now seeing the environment offer. Historically, conservation's been a negative thing. Conservation's been fencing off your land, take away your rights. And we're saying, no, 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 wait, why don't you do this for yourself? That is the biggest challenge that I think any conservation um, body or any person involved in conservation is facing today. It's an awesome challenge to try and get um, local people involved in conservation efforts to their advantage and to show it to their advantage. They need to feel it in their stomachs and feel it in their pockets and not just see it uh, viewed on, on television, for instance. It needs to be something physically tangible that they can actually feel. And, it, and it's, it's not something that will happen overnight. It's, it's an education process, but more than that, it involves commitment from conservationists. There, there has to be, you've got to put something in in order to get something out.
Even if there can be sufficient land reserves rehabilitated for wild animals in southern Africa, there are still some massive biological shadows casting a pall over their future. This lone young lion looking for a meal in the harsh surrounds of the drought-stricken lower veldt could be a worrying omen for the future of the lion population. Whole prides of lions in some areas of the region risk being decimated by a new threat, an epidemic of tuberculosis that threatens to sweep right across the entire continent. TB is an airborne disease, and lions can catch it from the buffalo they feed on and infect each other while feeding and grooming. If one looks at the, the feeding behavior of lions, in a pride situation, like they kill a buffalo, they fight, and they and so what can actually happen is that they can actually inhale some of those, those bacteria. And they, get, they can then get the pulmonary form, or the lung form, which then it forms these, these lesions. They don't look the same as in buffalo, but then they, with the coughing and fighting, they're able to spread it to the others. So it, it is a huge problem. At Shakuda Game Reserve, the lion breeding program is tightly managed, and all animals are carefully observed for any signs of the disease. But when it's time to move them to another enclosure, things don't always go to plan. This youngster has been darted with a tranquilizer and has sought refuge in a tree. Drugged and groggy, the lion sleeps, but not for long. Fortunately, the bushes below broke his fall and he suffered no serious injury. At worst, the lion's pride was hurt. He landed quite gracefully, actually, for a drug lion. <laughs> Lions are pretty tough, they're like cats, you know. He came down and he landed on his back feet, still gripping with his claws in the tree. You heard, you know, on the tree as he was gripping, came down. So he's pretty well all right. <laughs> Just take that dart out, hold the skin. Because they are isolated, the chances of the lions on Chikuda getting TB are virtually zero, so... I mean, one's looking many years down the line, but it may eventually end up that, that the private ranches may even be restocking national parks like Kruger and even Mphilosi. Mphilosi's got a huge problem with, with t TV. So private ranches uh, serve as a, as a nucleus of uh, perhaps future genetic material to, to restock these areas if the, you know, the, the, the problem were ever to get that big. So although TB isn't an epidemic yet, it's just another problem facing South Africa's big game. But there's an even bigger threat, and one that could be solved very easily. As a former government-funded researcher, big cat expert Thas de Vet now despairs at the level of government support for the preservation of endangered species. He says the drought isn't just confined to the weather. As far as the South African the new government is concerned, conservation-wise, we're going down the tubes. The, the, the government budgets for conservation just dried up. There's no proper conservation happening. It's only the, the regulatory stuff, the permits and, and, and a bit of law enforcement. But the research and everything that used to be done in conservation has, has disappeared out of the government. And it's the private enterprise, the, the, the um, private landowners will make or break conservation, the conservation of these carnivores in, in South Africa. So as usual, it comes down to the money, the almighty dollar, or in this case, the rand. People become more and more aware that they, that they, they have a role to play. And what makes it even more uh, attractive to people to conserve them is that the ecotourism uh, uh, prospect. These animals are able to pay for themselves. And one doesn't want to be mercenary about it, but there's so, so much pressure on our land uh, that unless a piece of land can, can actually produce money and be economically viable, it's, it's, going, it's going to be taken away for something else. So there's that old lo uh, slogan, I know it's very controversial, that says if conservation pays, it stays. The financial aspect is certainly a carrot. Um, the purists don't like it, but it's a fact. That's basically how they've been trained. With tourist-oriented operations now playing such a crucial role in the conservation of African wildlife, international support is critical. 
One way for people to help is to support wildlife organisations, but safari operator Jacqueline Burgess says she has an even better idea. Of course, the best thing for people would be to come here. And it's, that is also getting easier. You know, it is just from the UK 10 hours down and they can have a good time. And it doesn't have to be that expensive anymore. But people should give it a chance. If you have an opinion about things, okay, try to go down. Try to, you know, spend a, a nice holiday here and they will, they will change their mind. That's, I have no doubt about that. Our journey is fantastic. I mean, people generally move away here. They've, they've had such a fantastic experience. I mean, we have people sort of leave with, with, with tears rolling down their face. For us, it's more about the whole experience. It's, it's the wildlife, it's the people that, that live and work here as well, that touch people as well. There's no doubt that on an individual level, people's hearts are touched by these fabulous animals. And while individuals can make a difference by volunteering their time to help, or by donating money to various charities that fight for the wildlife, the challenge to save Africa's endangered species is so great that if humanity as a whole takes its eye off the ball for too long, then in the blinking of an eye, some of the world's most loved species of animals could disappear from the wild completely. As the drought, both financial and weather-wise, continues in Southern Africa, the danger of the extinction of these amazing animals also continues to grow. There are more than 4,700 species of mammals in the world today. Of those, 25% are on the red list of endangered species, and right at the top are some of Africa's greats. It's likely there will never be more than 4,700 mammal species in the world. However, there will be a lot less if humanity fails to act. It's time for humankind to give back some of what it has taken from this ancient land and save the animals of Africa before it is too late.